Beloved, you are welcome to take your own notes if you want to. I do not have a handout to hand you. I do not have PowerPoint. We are going to be in the Word. Uh, for those of you who have a written Word printed on page as God intended, you are certainly welcome to bring that out. For some of you weaker brothers or sisters who have only the electronic version that will pass away, and you are certainly welcome to use that. But what we're going to do, we're going to be marking scripture a lot. We're going to be putting out stakes that will help us stay inside the boundaries when we're coming to interpret God's word. So you're welcome to take your own notes. You're welcome to mark your own Bible. Uh, we also have with this, and we'll just have to see how this works out. But uh, we have prayer partners in here in our, in our sessions together. And so uh, sometimes I'm going to ask you to get with, and you can do this in two, three, or four people, however you want to. Look around the room. If you see a brother or sister who is sitting there, if you see an isolated little lamb, somebody do the Christian grace thing and welcome that brother or sister into a prayer group. But we are actually going to pray at the end. Some sessions will pray. Some sessions will say, get with your prayer partner. And let's talk about what we just learned. And then we'll come back, like a little five-minute thing, and then we'll come back. This is not carved in stone. This may change from session to session. This may look a little different tomorrow. But prayer partners, I'm going to mention at the end of this, so you'll know what I'm talking about in reference uh, to that. And so we have gold ahead, beloved. We have absolute gold. The topic, as you have seen in your program, is learning to handle the sword. And I am under the presumption that they are doing this out of Ephesians chapter 6, 17. Because it describes the sword of the Spirit, which is, present tense, the Word of God. Not was the Word of God, is the Word of God. And so this is a sword handling class. This is handling the Word of God class. We have 10 sessions, and the Gospel of Mark has been the topic that was given to me which I gladly took. I let Tom and Ross decide that, that and, and so gl delighted to do this. But what happens in this is that we've got 10 sessions and there are 16 chapters in the Gospel of Mark. And this will not be an exposition of the entire Gospel of Mark. We must be selective and we'll try to add some real key things Bottom line is, if we were going to do this in 15 sessions versus 10 sessions, we would do it differently. If we were going to do it in 20 sessions versus 10 sessions. I did one with First Peter. I did it with a group, and I'm not dropping hints on this. I did it with a group in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. And there was 24 sessions whoo, on First Peter. It was so overwhelming. I had to start at the back and work my way over to 1 Peter 1, and by all God's grace, it all fit together. So there's a lot of difference whether you're doing five sessions, 10 sessions, 20 sessions, 24 sessions. So we're not going to try to cover everything there is to cover in the Gospel of Mark, but we're going to definitely set the trail, see how far we'll get uh, in this. We'll leave out major points that is going to happen, but we're going to point in the right direction. Now a major component of the study, and we're going to start off today, and probably some of you will sit there and be thinking, what in the world is this man doing? We are, we're headed to the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to get through, uh, through a, kind of a different door, so to speak. So if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 10 is the first verse that we're going to look at in just one moment, Matthew chapter 10. Because what we're doing, and we're going to see this very, very clearly, one of the major components of our study, major components of handling the sword accurately, is the very simple, but also very much ignored. It is our responsibility to drop down into their world of the Bible. It is not our responsibility to pull the Bible up to our world. Now, I'm just talking about a study part with this. And I'm not talking about preaching the word. I'm not talking about how you are going to deliver it. We are talking about an exposition of God's word. We are going to focus on the content with this. And so in focusing on the content, it is our responsibility to drop down into their world. And I know this sounds so simple. 
Many times in America, it is not. Many times it is written, as far as people are concerned, that the book of Romans will be written to Americans. When we call it the book of America. And again, it's not saying that scripture is irrelevant to our society. It is absolutely relevant. But if you are going to study God's word, it is your responsibility, my responsibility, our responsibility to drop down into their world. See with their eyes, hear with their ears, look around. And so everything about this with the early part of the gospel message is that it is with a Jewish background. Now, when Paul wrote Romans in Romans 1 6, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God's power of God and the salvation of everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Sometimes Greek can mean Greek, such as the Greeks who came and said, we want to see Jesus. But the Jews divided the world into two categories. Jews and Nots. The Jews were called Jews. And the Nots were called Nots. Just kidding. And the Nots were called Gentiles. If you are not a Jew, you are a Gentile. It means nations. A lot of times it will be the same word in Hebrew. For nations, goyim, you don't need to know that necessarily. We get our word ethnic from this. Now I'm looking around the room. I am presuming most of us have Gentile backgrounds. Is that right? I do anyway. I am a pig-eating Gentile from a long and distinguished lineage of pig-eating Gentiles. Now if I was a pig-eating Jew under the Mosaic Covenant, I'd be breaking God's law. Right? Dropping down into their world, that would be an unclean food if I was, but I'm a pig eating Gentile. Now, I grew up before the internet. I grew up when TV was black and white, photos were black and white. Before there was an internet, before there was Grace to You or any such programs, before there was the MacArthur Study Bible, I grew up and I had no idea I was a Gentile. And how would you know? I mean, have you ever met a Galatian? How would you know what's the difference between a Galatian and a Gentile? And also in Ephesians chapter 4, 17, I think the verse is where it says that you do not walk as the Gentiles walk. And I remember thinking, well, I'm glad I'm not a Gentile. I've never met one. And how could you help not walking like a Gentile once I found out that I was a Gentile? Just a little side note with this. Today, in the Arab world and somewhat in the Jewish world, there's three divisions. Jew, Muslim, if you're not Jew, if you're not Muslim, you are Christian. Now you could be the most brazen atheist on the face of the earth, but you're not Jew, and you're not Muslim, you would be considered Christian. So a lot of times in the Middle East, they will introduce her as she is a born again Christian. Or this is a real Christian that we're talking about versus just kind of the catch-all designation. Now, the Jews for us kept it very, very simple. Jews and non-Jews, and that's going to be Gentiles. That is going to be the nations. And again, I had no idea. My mama was a Gentile. My daddy was a Gentile. I grew up among Gentiles. My wife is a Gentile. We have Gentile children. And so, but again, it's our responsibility to drop down into their world. Now, we're starting in Matthew chapter 10, picking up in mid-context, which is a very dangerous thing. And having summoned his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. If you mark your Bibles, Matthew chapter 10, verse 2. In verse 1, it was his 12 disciples. In Matthew 10, verse 2, this is the first time that apostles are used. And the names of the 12 apostles, someone designated authority. The name of the 12 apostles are these, and they are given authority in different realms in this regard. They're going to play a very important part with the church, we found it. So the apostles are there, but this is Jewish at the time. Now look at the restrictions that Jesus gives them. 
In Matthew chapter 5, verses 5, 6, and 7, this was the easiest commandments that Jesus ever gave the 12 apostles. Because he says in Matthew 10, 5, these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter into any city of the Samaritan. A Samaritan is half Jew, half Gentile. Mixed breed, they would call it. Mixed blood, Gentile blood mixed with Jewish blood. Not considered a full Jew. So in Matthew chapter 5, excuse me, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, Jesus tells them, do not go into the way of the Gentiles. No argument from them. And Peter's not going to say, Lord, Lord, let me go to the Gentiles. Peter's not going to say that. Jesus says, don't go to the Samaritans. Hey, <laughs> good so far. Here's what he says. Verse 6. But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's Jewish. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, beloved, aren't you glad that Matthew chapter 10 is not the end of Matthew's gospel? Aren't you glad that God has a different viewpoint? And that it's going to be unveiled, they walk through. Let's look, let's just peek over. We have to go from place to place with this before we go to Mark's gospel. Let's look at this precious promise. This is one of my favorite verses in Scripture. John chapter 10, such a wonderful section of Scripture. We could camp out in many gold mines. But there's one reference in particular that's very, very pertinent to our study. Because in Matthew chapter 10, this is not the end of the Bible. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10. This is the Good Shepherd chapter I'm the Good Shepherd, chapter 10, verse 14. I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me. And I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. If you mark your Bibles, beloved, John chapter 10, verse 16, here's a love letter, here's a love promise. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Those are Gentiles. Those are ethne, ethnic, we got our word from. These are nations. These are other peoples. Would this include London and England? Absolutely. America? Absolutely. I have other sheep that are not of this Jewish fold. I must bring them also. They shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. And we're going to see that taking place in, in God's word. We'll see that a little bit later on today. But isn't that a precious verse that our Savior gives? I am very, very proud to be another sheep. I have no trouble whatsoever having the crumbs from the table. I'm very glad to be the other sheep that are not of the Jewish fold. Now, that being said, let's take a peek at Matthew 28 at the end of this. It quote the Great Commissioning. Maybe we'll look at it just a little bit differently. Since we have already seen in, in Matthew chapter 10, when we come to Matthew chapter 28, of course, a whole, whole lot has happened. This is after the crucifixion. This is after the resurrection. A little bit before the ascension. But in Matthew chapter 28... Verse 16, the 11 disciples, it would be the 12 minus Judas. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. Then the last three verses in Matthew, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Look at verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples, look at this, of all the nations. This is exactly opposite of the restrictions that he gave the 12 in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. 
This is why dropping down into their world, Matthew 10 is no longer a part of the commandment of the Lord. You would be sinning against God. They would be sinning against God if all they did was go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Because now he says, go therefore, verse 19, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Just one little side note, a wonderful reference to the Trinity. Name singular, but three members were there, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A lot of times you run across people who say, there's no reference to the Trinity. Well, baptizing them, he doesn't say in the names, as though there are different ones kind of spread out apart from each other. In the name singular, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, or behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And so we live in Matthew 28. We do not live in Matthew 10. This is why, again, it's our responsibility to drop down into the world of the Bible to know where we are, to know what God is talking about. Matthew 10 was given to the Jewish people for a particular segment of time, given to the 12 apostles for a limited segment of time. Matthew 28 is given to us for a limited segment of time. That's our own individual life on earth, or it's the end of the age whenever he returns in this, whichever occurs, the rapture of the church, or our own going home to be with the Lord if you are saved. And so again, this is our responsibility to drop down into their world. But when we come to study the Gospels, we're going to have to back up. In fact, let's do this. I'm headed over to the book of Acts. And you're welcome to follow Acts chapter 1. We're not going to camp out there. We're just going to note this. Acts chapter 1. All the way over to Acts chapter 7. Everything about this is Jewish. From Acts 1 through Acts 7, everything about this is Jewish. Jesus said, go to, from Jerusalem. They were in Jerusalem. To Judea. Judea was the region that contained Jerusalem. So Acts 1 through 7 is totally Jewish when you are reading this. When you come to the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2, everybody there that was saved was Jews at that particular time. The Gospels go into the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile, as Paul says. But when you read Acts 1 through 7, this is Jewish. When we come to Acts chapter 8, look what takes place with this. Now remember, this would have been different than Matthew 10 verses 5 through 7. In Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans receive the gospel. Look what it says. Philip, in verse 4, is used here. In Acts chapter 8, just a few verses of this, verses 4 through 6, there has been a scattering of the Christians because Saul is persecuting them. Stephen has been buried in Acts chapter 7. When in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, therefore those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And look at the result of this, verse 6. And the multitudes with one accord were given attention to what, Philip had, what was said by Philip. As they heard and saw signs which he was performing. For in this case, many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. And so the big deal with this, though, Acts chapter 8, no longer is the church totally Jewish. From Acts chapter 8, you've got Samaritans, half Jew, half Gentile. And they did not like each other, as you are well aware. The good Samaritan, are you kidding? It would be a, a, kind of like the good jihadist type of uh, scenario with us. Jesus talked to a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. That's why when Jesus gave them the commands in Matthew 10, verses 5 through 7, don't go to the Gentiles gladly, no, not a problem. Don't go to the Samaritans, not a problem. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
Now, this is being reversed. Now, Samaritans receive the gospel. And just setting boundaries here. When you come over to Acts chapter 10, we're not going to camp out. You can read that on your own. But in Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles receive the gospel. Cornelius and his household. But it's in Acts chapter 10 that the Gentiles received the gospel. Now, just a little disclaimer with that. That does not mean that Gentiles in the Old Testament, all of them were unsaved. You have people like Ruth, the Moabite, that's a Gentile woman. You have Rahab, the harlot, and just for the record, you can drop the harlot part when you talk to her in heaven. And what would she call you in place of that? You can just call her Rahab or that, or the new name that God gives her. You have Uriah the Hittite, who was more honorable than David at that particular time. You've got the people in Nineveh. You've got the reluctant Jonah going there, a very reluctant missionary with a very simple message, repent. And I hope you don't, because he didn't like the people of Nineveh. He didn't like Assyria. He was very scared about what was going to happen, because the Assyrians were going to come down. Jonah goes and says, repent. And what do you know? From the king all the way down to the lowliest of the low, they repented. And they received the Lord. You'll find the Syrians in heaven. You'll find all kinds of people in heaven. So I'm not saying that it was impossible for Gentiles to be saved. A bunch of people saved in the Old Testament that were not of the Jewish fold. But God had a very special plan and program for the Jewish people for this. But when we come to Acts chapter 10, Cornelius is going to be the first one of the Gentiles to receive the gospel. And if we are Gentile, I mean, this is part of our spiritual heritage. And praise God for the gospel going to the Jews first, Acts 1 through 7, to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. This is the one where Peter has the vision of, quote, unclean food under the Mosaic Covenant. Three different times God says, what I have cleansed, don't you consider dirty? And Peter says, I've never eaten anything like that. And God's not just talking about food groups. He's talking about people groups. What I've cleansed Gentiles, Acts chapter 10, don't you consider dirty? And that, you can go read this account itself. This is why Peter was not a Baptist preacher, because he did not have time to give the invitation. The people got saved before he could, could say anything. He's not even finished. And the Holy Spirit falls upon them. And then you read through this, you can go on there your own, I believe it's chapter 11 of Acts, and Peter goes back, the Jewish people came to him, and instead of saying, praise God for this wonderful work that you've done, they said, you ate with them, you ate with Gentiles. I've eaten with Gentiles most of my life, you ate with Gentiles, and Peter said, I couldn't help it. I said, I'm preaching and all this, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it did us in the beginning in Acts chapter 2. We're not second-class Christians as Gentiles, and Paul's going to write later, book of Ephesians especially, Jew and Gentile in one body, unheard of before the cross. In Old Testament times, there was a court of the Gentiles. That the court, that's as far as the Gentiles could go. And so we live this side of Acts chapter 10. We live in a different part. And it is with this background that we come to chapter 12 of Acts. And this is going to set the table for where we are headed. In chapter 12 of Acts, let's look at the first oh, four verses, I think we'll do. First four verses for this. In Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, now about that time Herod, and this would be Herod Agrippa 1, there are different Herods in the Bible. This is a different Herod than in, we find in the early part of the life of Jesus, the one that tried to kill the baby, kill the Messiah, kill the other babies at Bethlehem. That one had died, is no longer on the scene, this is a different Herod. Now, about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. 
Now, it was during the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There'd be another way of saying this. Is this during Passover? Now, again, dropping down in their world, Passover was required by God. If you were going to be an obedient Jew, you could not miss Passover. The nation stopped. Exodus 23, Leviticus chapter 23, this is mandatory. Year by year by year, you come up to Jerusalem, you come up to the place that I have selected for the lambs to be sacrificed. And so this will be multitudes of people. God gave one other month. If you missed the first Passover for whatever reason, you had to come one month later. And if it didn't, then your sins were born by you. That's how serious God took this. And so Passover, massive amount, multitudes of people are there. And James, the brother of John, not James who wrote the book of James. This will be a different James. James, the brother of John. James, the brother of John, who came to Jesus in Mark 10, said, we want to sit in your glory, one on your right, one on your left. Jesus says, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And they said, yeah, we're able. The cup for James ended Acts chapter 12. His head's cut off. Not so much that he dies, which he does die, but he goes home to be with the Lord. His race ended, so to speak. All right, so Herod looks around and sees that that pleased the Jews, so they arrested Peter. And when he had seized him, verse 4, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers. That's a lot for one guy, I know, for one Jewish guy. Four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. Now, they're going to bring him out before the people so that Peter will have the same type of execution that James had. Now, we need to stay in Acts 12, but we need to look at one verse. Now, you're welcome to take your pinky if you have a printed Bible and take your pinky and hold on to Acts chapter 12 or your prayer partner's pinky. It can be used to hold that. But we need to look at Acts 12, which we're coming back to. We need to look at this in a biblical framework. Hang on to Acts chapter 12. Turn back just very briefly, a few chapters, back to John chapter 21. Here is the chapter. Might as well do... Verse 15, they've already seen the resurrected Jesus. He's prepared a meal for them. John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now remember, it's just been a few days, relatively speaking. The Simon Peter made his threefold denial, cussing, if we say in the South, even one of those. Denying that he even knew Jesus at all. None of this, I'm going to lay down my life for you. Let none of this, let it all fall away. I'll stand with you, Jesus. Peter, Simon Peter, son of John, you love me more than these. He said to him in verse 15, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd, my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, ten, my sheep. And then he said in verses 18 and 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, we mentioned these verses on Saturday, if you were here. Truly, truly, I say to you that when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. In verse 19, now this, he said, probably with his hands out like this to show the marks of the crucifixion in Jesus' hands. 
Now, this he said, signifying what kind of death he, Peter, would, and we mentioned this as well, it doesn't say the type of death he would die, but the type of death by which he would glorify God. It's all in a different perspective. Now, in John chapter 21, Jesus says, you are going to die, in essence, you are going to die a death by crucifixion. Now, in Acts chapter 12, James has been beheaded. Peter has been imprisoned. Herod intends to cut off Peter's head. Now, biblically speaking, I promise you, even though I know the outcome, I've read this, and some of you have read the outcome as well. I bet you a nickel. If God says, this is how it's good. They have nickels over here. What do they have with place of nickels in UK? Huh? A shilling? A penny? Half penny? They have all that stuff? What, what's the lowest? What's, uh, one one a half penny? One penny? All right, I bet you five pennies. How's that? That's would be a nickel. A nickel would be five pennies in America. I bet you a nickel. That's as high as I go on my bet. I bet you five pennies for this. If Jesus says Peter's going to die death by crucifixion, and here it says I'm going to cut off his head, who do you think is going to win on this? And people miss this. I mean, it's well intended. Look what it says in chapter 12 of Acts. So Peter was kept in prison, verse 5. But prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. This is one case where the church is praying, but God is, they're actually lining up with God's will more than they realize. And look at this in verse 6. And on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, look what takes place with this. Peter was sleeping. Now, would you be sleeping if you were going to be executed the next day? Peter knows he's not going to be executed. He doesn't know what's going to happen yet. But Peter sleeps through this because it's not his time to die. Now, whether God would kill Herod on the spot, well, let's just see what happens with this. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared. And a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and roused him, waking him up, saying, get up quickly. And his chains fell off. And the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandals. He did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. But he, Peter, thought he was seeing a vision. And then in verse 10, when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street and immediately... The angel departed from him. Now, beloved, here would be a good example of bad exposition. If you were to take chapter 12 for the exposition, and exposition, we're talking about what it's talking about. If you were to take this and say, God wants you to go and open prison gates in your own life or in other people's lives. This is not what the text is talking about. God wants you to be an angel in somebody else's life. This is not what the text is talking about. And so if you're talking about an exposition of the text, you're talking about what took place at that particular time. There's actually no instructions that are given to anybody else. Now, can we learn lessons from this? Absolutely. God's faithful to his word. God will even send an angel as needed to accomplish his will to make sure that things are going to happen. But if you're talking about exposition, you're just talking about, again, not that you can't make application later on, but if you're talking about exposition, you're just talking about this is what the text is talking about. This is a historical account of a miracle of the Lord in order to fulfill his word that he said in John chapter 21. 
And Peter comes to his senses, so to speak, wakes up. Now, why have we been doing this? Partly to set the table for where we are going. But if you mark your Bibles in Acts chapter 12, look at what it says. So when he, Peter, realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John. And if you mark your Bibles, who was also called Mark. This is the first time that Mark occurs in the Bible. This is the same Mark that is the author of the Gospel of Mark. This is the first time that he shows up. Now, we're going to pick up with him a little bit later. Might as well just do the context of this last two verses again to put them together. When Peter, verse 11, came to himself, he says, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When you realize this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathering together and were praying. You can put it this way. The house church was at Mark's home. That was his mom's place there. But Mark is involved in this house church, or or worded this way. The house church praying for Peter, the one that was praying fervently, was gathered in the house of Mark. The same Mark is going to be the author of the gospel of Mark. Now, this is the first time that Mark occurs in Scripture. It's not going to be the last time. We need to set the table to pick up a few of some of the details, rather. And we'll do that in our next session. Now, I need you to do one thing for me, if you will. I need you to get with your prayer partners. So some of you have come in later, you might have to ask somebody else, some of you prayer partners to be. You might want to look around and rescue some of the sheep who came in late. Basically, as prayer partners, what we're going to do, sometimes it's, got me. Sometimes it's just real good. Take what we've got, even on the run. Here's what we do as prayer partners this time, two or three people. Let's talk about one or two or three things that we have learned out of our first session in handling the sword. And let's take, oh, about five minutes to do that. You have to move around, some of you, with this. Clock is ticking, and then we're going to come back. Off you go. So let's get with prayer partners, please. Off we go. And just two or three things about what we've learned so far.